We've been dealing with counterpoise for handheld rubber duck antennas for quite some time and we've seen in the field that they do increase your performance and they're especially recommended for deep backcountry situations where repeaters might have to be accessed during emergencies. We've just upped the game with our rat tail because there's a few things that I've learned over time and when I go back and look at a lot of the popular videos on YouTube I see what appears to be some common misconceptions which could make a significant difference to how you make your rat tail in terms of the materials and the design as well and we're gonna run few uh, run through excuse me a few of these things and uh, then you can make up your own mind as to how you'd like to proceed let's start with what we know a rat tail or counterpoise more accurately is accomplishing and how it relates to one of these so we know that we are looking to emulate a ground plane and the reason that you want a good ground plane is without it you don't get your signal propagation now a good ground plane does not offer resistance and has a high level of capacitance a bad ground plane then would be something like snow cover or water so it would stand to reason that your virtual ground pane that, that uh, is represented by your counterpoise would have similar characteristics and so you'll see videos uh, there's one that has probably over 200,000 views uh, and hundreds of likes where it's recommended that you use the thinnest wire you can find and he tears a piece of ribbon cable off and then uses that and here's a, a thin piece that we used to use which is probably double the piece of ribbon cable however what we know about wire and the associated gauges are the smaller the gauge the more the resistance and therefore the less capacitance ability it has so it would make sense go to the largest gauge wire that's practical now I guess you could use a booster cable for your car which wouldn't be very practical or a welding cable but what we've come up with is basically using silicone coated 10 AWG which is 10 gauge multi-stranded copper strand wire with a silicone sheath on it and that's our compromise between using some welding cable and using a really thin strip of ribbon cable the next thing that you will we'll see discussed and used is the use of adapters at the bottom of the antenna in order to facilitate the attachment point for the counterpoise and adapters increase the length of your antenna and antennas are tuned to the specific frequencies and that's why if you use a stock antenna that comes with the radio and you're trying to transmit on commercial frequencies your standing wave ratio is horrendous and all you're doing is damaging your radio as well as having extremely poor performance characteristics and there's no rubber duck on the planet that can be tuned that works through 144 through 174 you can't do it you have to be able to tune the antenna and the antenna is tuned by its length so let's look at these two antennas and the one on my right is with the green color is center tuned at 165 megahertz 
the yellow one is center tuned at 170. Now you'll see the difference on those is about a quarter of an inch, not quite, and that represents 5 megahertz. So what happens when we increase the length, let's say we used an adapter that took it to about half that amount. So we're going to move that up to about there. And now you can see that we've increased the length of that 170 and effectively we've probably turned that into an antenna with a much lower frequency such as 145 or 150. In fact, let's have a look now and compare it to a 150. So judging by how much length we've gained on the 170, it has now become a longer frequency than the 165. So we could probably say that this is about the equivalent of somewhere between 155 and 160 instead of 170 that it was intended to be. And that's when we've gone about half the way up for the first adapter. What if we went to the furthest extreme of this adapter and mounted that on the radio? Now that antenna would become that long. It has now exceeded the 150, which is the black one on my left, and it's probably now around 145 megahertz. So if you really want to uh, change the tuning of your antenna and you know what you're doing, an adapter would be a good way to do it. However, that's probably not the intent when you're throwing an adapter on in order to facilitate the use of counterpoise. Another common hack that is recommended for attaching your counterpoise to your radio, especially if you don't have any uh, ground plane surface on your radio to make an attachment point to, which in the case of a lot of modern radios, they don't exist. For example, here's the only metal attachment point on this MD390TYT and you can see that um, on that you may get a ground plane uh, and you can ascertain that by checking the continuity between that and that attachment point but other radios may have the belt clip attachment point on the battery itself and therefore not a cheap ground and you may not have any other ground connection points as well the counterpoise should really correspond to the base of your radio not be some other distance away from it because it is a reference point. So these spades are quite often shown as something that you can modify. This one's larger than what you would normally need but it's the one that I had close to hand and they are generally supposed to fit down in here. It means you're going to have to bend this up which may not work well with your antenna and um, find something because most radios now have this recess. <clears throat> They're either using the SMA female or SMA male antenna base. These two radios represent one of each and you can see they're both recessed. So getting the speed into there first of all involves a little bit of modifications but that's not the biggest downside. If we measure the thickness of the material that this spade uses, we get about one millimeter. And let's have a look at the two most common antenna bases and antenna mounts on radios these days, which are either SMA male or SMA female. Both of them involve a pin. And if we take a look at the pin in here, on this one, the SMA male base, you can see that pin is perhaps four millimeters. That's the amount of travel that it's going to have from where it reaches the threads. Maybe even let's call it five, which is pushing it. Actually, I'm going to go back to, okay, so we'll call five. Now, one millimeter out of that five is 20%. So when you've got this underneath your base and you're screwing that onto your radio, your pin is now has 20% less travel 
in terms of it meeting in to your SMA mail base. <clears throat> now, not all bases are created equal, but now you have 20% less connection for your center element that's connecting to your radio and that's not really something you want in terms of having good antenna performance. You want as much of that pin mating with the other side as possible. So you're effectively screwing your antenna base 20% less down and having a 20% less mating surface, potentially 20% less conductivity and how's that going to affect the performance of your antenna? I'd rather not play with that and find out. So how do you get around using the spade then? Well as we said you might be able to make a connection to your radio. That's certainly not going to be very convenient if you have to use a screw and you only need to mount counterpoise uh, for an ephemeral amount of time while you're making a ad hoc connection to a repeater and so what we've done in the past is soldered directly on to the bases. However, I often would find I would have to test the bases for continuity after that and the heat of soldering often would melt the center insulators that insulate the ground from the center in there. As you can see, it's, there's plastic in there. So that was not highly desirable. So it may not even be possible on some forms of connectors to even do that. What we ended up coming up with was spot welding a nickel strip collar with a tab on it onto the base. And now you've got a direct connection to the base of the antenna without having to shorten how far it screws into your radio and without having to damage the potential insulating material in the center by the heat of soldering onto it. So spot welding is the answer there. And the nickel collar goes all the way around the base instead of just having a tab spot welded on due to the differential between the conductivity of the nickel and the substrate material that they use to make up this base which could be a variety of materials from brass or so on. So you put the nickel collar right around then you spot weld it on you don't have heat wrecking your internal insulating materials in the base and another benefit of that is now your counterpoise or rat tail if you will can now be exiting and attached to your base at a 90 degree angle and so it's not being bent and with a solder joint there solder joints are brittle and eventually over time they'll break off whereas this one it could still break off if it gets a lot of flex back and forth back and forth length now let's talk about the optimum length for your counterpoise a standard recommended for VHF is 11 and a half inches or so and that's shortened to a little more than half that if you go to UHF and then you'll see recommendations if you're using dual band to go to something like 19 uh, for dual band. However, as a seat of the pants rule, I guess you'll get by with that and um, it might be the best you're going to get unless you want to get fancier and some of the factors affecting your length of course are as you probably know you're trying to achieve a quarter wavelength based upon this being the equivalent of your radial for your ground plane but that distance is commonly dictated by not only uh, the quarter wavelength of what you're achieving so in other words, if this long antenna here represents 142 megahertz and this is 170, that would 
change. If you only use this one all the time, that would be a different length for your counterpoise than this one would be. But not only does that affect it, but look at the velocity factor. The velocity factor of this one decreases due to the dual wall tubing that is used on the IPX6 antenna which is basically this antenna coated with the dual wall tubing to make it more rugged in the field and so therefore it has to be tuned accordingly to take into effect the change in the velocity factor and that velocity factor differential will also dictate the ultimate length for being optimal for your counterpoise. So it's not just that simple where you just come up with that one measurement and it works best for all antennas. However, the 11.5 for VHF is probably going to be your best bet if you don't know the velocity factor of your materials.